Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to our Toronto AI in Robotics L seminar. Today we are glad to have Wen Yuan Zeng to give a talk on neural world models for autonomous driving. Wen Yuan Zeng is a PhD candidate from the University of Toronto. Prior to that, he obtained his bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University. He's also a research scientist in the industrial labs such as Uber and Wabi conducting cutting-edge research on autonomous driving. Wen Yuanzeng's primary interest lies at the intersection of computer vision, robotics, and machine learning. His long-term vision is to build autonomous robots that can learn like humans and operate reliably in the real world. His current research focuses on building holistic and interpretable neural autonomous driving systems. To this end, he leverages his knowledge in the full spectrum of autonomous driving, such as perception, decision making, simulation, and deep structure learning to innovate systems that are flexible to handle real world complexities, generalizable to novel things, robust to uncertainties, and interpretable to humans. So, Wenyuan, we are all looking forward to your talk. Uh, please feel free to take over. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction and thank you for inviting me today. Can you see my screen? Ah, uh, yes, it's good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, just one sec. Okay, yeah. So I'm really excited to be here um, and share some of my works on neural world models for autonomous driving. So um, as the in introduction suggested, uh, the main focus of this talk is to investigate what are the key technical challenges for nowadays autonomous driving and how we can build a more intelligent driving system by drawing inspirations from human intelligence. Um, so feel free to uh, raise any questions uh, during the talk. Uh, ha I'm happy to take them. Um, oops. Yeah, so um, I guess Zio already introduced, uh, but let me just quickly uh, talk about the past experiences. So I got my bachelor degree from Tsinghua University, uh, majoring in math and physics. And after that, I came to University of Toronto for my PhD study. And I'm currently working with Raquel Wooterson from the machine learning group. Um, I was also a research scientist at Uber ATG since 2017. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with it, uh, the ATG is basically the autonomous driving unit uh, within Uber. And I spent four amazing years there working um, um, on, on the autonomous driving, such as perception, prediction, planning, as well as simulation. And around 2021, Raquel left Uber and founded a new uh, self-driving truck startup, uh, which is called Wabi. And I'm very fortunate to be part of it since the very beginning. Um, and more recently, I slightly transitioned my research interest into the closed loop learning as well as behavior simulation. Okay, so um, there's already too many words about myself. Uh, now let's begin our talk today. So um, autonomous driving is really, really, really exciting. I think you all agree that this technology is gonna completely change our life. And because of this, many, many talented researchers as well as big companies has committed in this direction and also billions of dollars has been invested in the past several decades. Um, but unfortunately, it seems autonomous driving is still only exist in the newspapers. So why is this so difficult? Why we cannot solve it? In my opinion, there are quite a few key technical challenges we need to address. First of all, our war is inherently stochastic. For example, uh, these pedestrians in this image, they may either wait for the car or just keep going. So this requires our autonomous driving system to, to, make, um, to be robust enough for all this um, stochasticity. And second, our war is highly complex. Uh, we have sophisticated traffic flow. We also have many different kinds of traffic participants. So we need flexible system that can handle all these complexities. And we also need generalization so that we can handle unexpected case on the road. And finally, it would be ideal if somehow we can quantify the safety of our driving system so that we can trust our life on it. So how can we do all of this? Um, we know there are all kinds of fancy neural networks 
that seem to do very well in many AI applications. If you just deploy those neural networks, uh, for example, to detect or segment objects on the road, you're going to see these demos that produce pretty accurate results. So similar to this, many people would like to build end-to-end uh, -end neural networks directly from sensor data to the final driving command and learn everything about driving just from the data. On one hand, this approach is really, really powerful. As you can imagine, the model is highly flexible and you can learn robust behavior that fit all your data distribution. But on the other hand, it is also quite limited because directly interacting with a high dimensional image space uh, is very complicated and also learn driving semantics from scratch is very, very challenging. As a result, it requires so much data to train and has many difficulties to generalize. But here comes a problem. Here comes a question. Uh, why our humans can deal with the same complicated image space and learn to drive very easily? The core idea behind is the world model. Essentially, uh, the real world is indeed very complicated, very colorful, uh, but no one actually imagines every single details of the war in his brain. To give you an example, uh, in this image or in this scenario, we know there is a man riding a bicycle, but the color of his t-shirt or uh, the McDonald in the background are not relevant to our driving task at all. So we can just ignore those complexities. More concretely, human use many prior knowledge they have and first abstract the real world into some selected concepts, and then predict how the world will evolve. And based on those results, we can evaluate the cause or the reward of different actions, and finally choose the most proper one. In spite of this, uh, a commonly adopted approach in the industry uh, for uh, solving the autonomous driving is to build an artificial world model using a stack of robotic modules. From the very beginning on the left, uh, we can have sensor data as input. We then do perception, which is to recognize objects in the scene. From there, we can predict how these objects are going to move. And lastly, we produce planning maneuvers based on the cost of different actions. So such a pipeline factorizes a complex driving problem into subproblems that are either to solve and generalizing a combinatorial manner. It also allows you to encode many uh, human prior knowledge through hard-coded rules, and thus it can guarantee our vehicle to drive uh, in a traffic rule compliant manner. However, uh, this approach also brings uh, many challenges and problems. For example, the high design interfaces between different modules um, have only low bandwidth to pass information, and thus they can lose important uncertainty information for making robust decisions. And furthermore, uh, such a rule-based expert system is known to be very fragile. So, so the theme of my research is to combine this to an innovative third paradigm. Basically, uh, we want to enjoy the power of both data and knowledge. And the key principle is to model the world with knowledge and then learn what knowledge doesn't provide us. In particular, uh, I have explored in two directions, including learning to perceive and learning to act. Uh, to give you a number of concrete examples of what I have been working on, in the first direction, oh, sorry, um, I aim to build intermediate representation for the war model that can be learned efficiently and encode rich information about the environment. This includes three aspects. Uh, from the spatial aspect, I have built graph structure representation for actors and scene based on the map topology. This helps us achieve 10 times more efficient learning compared to prior works. And we also got the first place on the challenging Argoverse competition leaderboard. From the temporal aspect, we build deep temporal features and learn to track object consistently. This is one of the first work that enables end-to-end -end optimization for perception, tracking, and prediction in the loop. And lastly, I have also explored collective aspect 
where we enable vehicle to learn a collective representation of the environment and then intelligent, intelligently broadcast, receive and fuse those information with other nearby vehicles to get a broader and more accurate view of the world. Importantly, this is uh, the first work that deeply integrates the modern computer vision system with the V2X setting and demonstrate great potentials. But of course, uh, owning perceived the world is not enough for uh, autonomous driving. So in today's talk, I will describe some of our efforts on learning to act. Uh, I will showcase how we integrate learning with knowledge and make intelligent driving system. So this includes, first of all, how we bridge observation with action through a neural planner, and how we build a multi-feature dynamic model of the world to further enhance our driving, uh, basically to improve the reliability and robustness. And lastly, how we close the loop uh, back from action to sensor and test our holistic driving system through a better uh, simulation environment. Okay, so to begin with, uh, the first challenge is how to bridge observation with action. Uh, as mentioned earlier in, in previous slides, uh, the most popular approach is to directly produce driving command from a network. But in practice, we find that this is not enough to learn the semantics and causal relations in the driving task. And thus, uh, this approach generalizes very poorly. Now, let's see how we can tackle this. So our observation or input data or sensor data, including LiDAR and high definition maps. We feed them into a convolutional neural network and extract high dimensional features that encode rich contextual information about the environment. From there, uh, if we only wanna do object detection following standard routine, we just need to classify and regress the position of different bounding boxes and combine them into detection uh, bounding boxes. But we can do even more. Uh, we can regress not only the current position of different actors, but also their future positions simultaneously so that we have the predictions of each actor as well. So until now, we have a simplified version of the world models. This enforces the feature to encode semantically meaningful information about the environment and also potentially help us to learn causally disentangled features that lead to better generalization. Uh, so now we need to address the limitations of directly learning the actions. And our solution is to learn a neural potential field that characterizes the landscape of planning cost. Essentially, it tells us which locations induce low cost and we should drive to there versus uh, which locations have high cost and we should avoid. To produce such a neural potential field, we use a network to decode a 2D tensor from our backbone features. Uh, each pixel in this tensor basically corresponds to a real world XY coordinate. And the value of that pixel is the cost if we actually drive to that location. Now, let's say uh, we like to know whether this left turn trajectory is a good plan or not under this scenario. Um, we just need to evaluate its cost on this field. Apparently, this trajectory is bad because it has very high cost, potentially colliding with other objects. Alternatively, going straight is a much better decision in this scenario uh, because the trajectory associates with low planning cost. Therefore, uh, this neural potential field allows us to evaluate arbitrary trajectories. And in order to find the best planning decisions, we exploit a sampling-based optimization process. Basically, uh, we first sample a wide variety of trajectories and then select the one with the minimum cost. Importantly, our computations from the raw sensor data to the final driving command uh, can be done in a few milliseconds. However, there's no label for such a neural potential field. Um, so how to learn it becomes a real challenge. Uh, to tackle this, 
we follow the intuition that you know human driver would always choose a good, good trajectories. So we can encourage the potential field to produce low cost wherever close to human trajectories. And furthermore, to avoid a trivial solution that gives you low cost everywhere, we can randomly sample counterfactual trajectories and penalize our neural potential field along those trajectories, especially uh, when they collide with other vehicles or when they violate any traffic rules. Okay, so here we benchmark our planning performance. On the left, uh, we report the L2 distance between human trajectories and the model outputs. Uh, we can see our method outperforms a well-crafted Rubik's planner. It's slightly behind imitation learning because um, this is essentially the objective function. Uh, I mean, the L2 is essentially the objective function that imitation learning is trying to optimize. But of course, owning or fading to a human uh, is not necessarily good. Without truly understanding driving semantics and traffic rules, we will have many dangerous driving behaviors. And to demonstrate this, we also show collision rate and lane violation rate on the right. As you can see, our approach performs much better than both learning-based and rubric planner. Uh, let's look at some qualitative results. So our model takes LiDAR and MAP as input and output detection as well as prediction. Um, and for the motion planning potential field, we highlight low cost region for different future time step using different colors. Our plan trajectory is showing red. As you can see, uh, our planner can follow the lane very nicely. And I also noted that our new potential field captures multimodality. In this case, we can either go straight or lane change to the right. And when approaching to an intersection, we can either uh, go straight or take, take a turn. Uh, we can also handle blockage. Uh, this model shows a preference to lane change in that scenario in order to avoid collision. And those are, uh, the last two are two examples of super nudging in heavy traffic. Um, and for this slide, um, I just wanna show our model also understand traffic lights. Uh, so given the same input data exam from except from the traffic light state. Our plan trajectory deaccelerates with the light is red, which is shown on the left, and uh, maintains speed when the light is green, which is shown on the right. And here, I believe, are two more examples of the traffic light um, cases. OK, so that's about this approach. Um, it looks pretty promising uh, with a lot of interesting quantitative and qualitative results. But there are still limitations. Uh, first, right now we conduct planning and prediction separately, but they are actually highly coupled problems. In addition to that, right now we only predict a single trajectory for each actor, but the real world is complex and stochastic. So what we really need is to capture complex interactions among actors and predict multiple possible futures with uncertainty estimations. To this end, uh, we build a multi-feature dynamic model of the world and plan action based on that. Uh, let's take a closer look at how we build this model. Again, we take raw sensor data as input into the backbone um, and then detect objects in the scene. But then, uh, predicting flexible distribution while allowing real-time probabilistic inference is very, very challenging. To tackle this, uh, we use a deep energy formulation to explicitly model the uncertainty distribution. Specifically, uh, for each actor in, for each detected actor in the scene, uh, we sample a wide variety of trajectories that are physically possible under the dynamic constraints of those vehicles. And this forms a dense set of possible actions that each actor can take. We then use a network to predict probability, probabilities over these actions and use the network uh, and, and then uh, to learn such a flexible distribution in a data-driven manner. 
This also naturally brings us the multimodality as shown in this figure. Uh, essentially, what we do is to discretize the action space, and this helps us to bypass the difficult inference problem in the continuous space, and thus we achieve real-time inference. However, there's still one remaining problem, uh, that is to learn the multi-agent interaction, uh, which is very complicated to capture. Um, it is problem problematic with the uh, current proposal because there's no annotations for those interactions in the data, so we can now just directly learn them um, from the data. As you can see, uh, using our current data-driven approach, uh, our model still has conflicting future predictions for different actors. So to better capture these interactions, we model each actor as a node in a probabilistic graph, and their edges, or also known as pairwise energy, encode our knowledge about their interactions, such as collision avoidance, yielding, etc. And after conducting a marginal inference that passes information between different nodes, we can see the updated final estimation can capture multi-agent interactions. For planning, uh, we can also produce the planning cost following our previous work and then encoding interaction with other actors through edges between eagle node and the other actors node. And finally, combine this to and conduct a minimization process to get the final planning trajectory. So, uh, okay, so we first draw our uh, quantitative results on the prediction performance compared to several state-of-the-art uh, prediction methods. As you can see, which we achieved significantly lower prediction error across different metrics on different data sets. And to evaluate multi-agent interaction, uh, we also compute the collision rate among predicted trajectories of different actors, which is showing on the uh, rightmost uh, figure. Um, our ap approach clearly does a better job and achieves almost zero rate. And in terms of planning, um, again, we compare with the imitation learning as well as, as, well as our previous neural planner work. Uh, as you can see here, by explicitly incorporating a dynamic model of the work into the driving process, uh, we now achieve much, much better planning performance uh, in terms of lower collision rate and also lower uh, lane violation rate. Now let's see some qualitative results. Uh, previously, as I mentioned, we can only predict the most likely trajectory for each actor, so a single trajectory for each actor. Uh, but now we can predict multiple possible futures uh, as shown here. Uh, we use different color represent different future time step. For example, this, uh, I believe it's a one second into the future, and this is the uncertainty at two seconds into the future, and this is three seconds. Um, as shown in this highlighted circle, our model really capture all the possible futures uh, like turning left or going straight or turning right. Here's a short demo. Uh, as you can see, our dynamic model nicely captured the multimodality, especially when the vehicles are approaching to an intersection. Uh, you may also notice that when vehicles are driving on the street lanes, our model is very certain about its direction uh, and a little bit uncertain about its future velocity, which makes sense. Uh, this case, I believe, is, um, yeah. So in this case, we uh, perfectly predict that the leading vehicle gonna stop, and then we take a nudging behavior to avoid collision with that parked car. Okay, um, so far we have discussed how we can learn to act from sensors. In the last part of my presentation today, I'd like to briefly talk about how, uh, how we close the loop back from action to sensor and end-to-end -end test our driving system. To begin with, uh, here I show a standard simulation pipeline where uh, it relies on 3D assets designed by human uh, designers and also a physics-based graphics engine. 
as a result, uh, first of all, it is too expensive to scale such a virtual war. And second, the simulated LiDAR also looks super non-realistic uh, in the sense that it's too clean without a lot of noises we see in the real data. So we want to overcome both of these limitations. And again, uh, the solution is data plus knowledge. So from large scale data, we automatically build a geometric model of the world, including geometry for the static scene, as well as objects in the scene. Uh, this allows us to cheaply scale our virtual scenarios. And from there, we use a combination of physics-based renderer, as well as a learning-based fine tuner to get more realistic LiDAR simulation. Now, let me illustrate how our approach uh, works in details. So here I show how we reconstruct the geometric model of the world from our data, rather than creating those um, world model by designers. In particular, we firstly drive in the city uh, to collect the raw LiDAR data and align them together. This gives us a dense point cloud after fusion. We then remove all layers and meshify the point cloud to get the final results. Using a similar approach, we can also reconstruct and build a large scale 3D asset bank for different actors. Here I show a screenshot of uh, these 3D assets and you can see we have different type of actors like vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. And furthermore, um, all these actors are really diverse. For example, uh, we can find a lot of different edge situations in our asset bank but typically you wouldn't see them in other 3D assets or CAD model databases. Okay, so now we have the geometric model of the world um, as well as the geometric model of actors. If you know the physics law behind LiDAR, you're gonna notice that now we are able to simulate LiDAR using some computer graphics techniques, uh, which is called recasting. Because basically uh, the LiDAR sensor is shooting rays and then receive those rays when they bounce back from some surfaces. So we can simulate this process by just recasting over our 3D model of the world. But in practice, when we do this, uh, we find that a simple recasting process can now generate realistic uh, LiDAR patterns. For example, it produced much more dense point clouds than real data as shown in, uh, in both of these uh, highlighted circle. This is because in reality, um, there are other complicated physical processes involved, such as uh, refractions or absorbing by the atmospheres, and those physical processes are really difficult to simulate. But fortunately, uh, we have enough data, so we can potentially just learn to simulate whatever physics doesn't provide us. In this case, uh, we feed some important features of recasted simulation results and ask, ask the network to predict how likely a rail will be dropped. This can be learned from the real LiDAR redraw patterns and, though, and thus we can bypass the complicated physical process. So this figure uh, summarizes our approach. Inspired by the physics rendering process, we first reconstruct assets and scene from the real data, and then use a physics model plus learning to simulate our final realistic LiDAR point cloud. And to benchmark uh, the realism, realism of our approach, we compare against the best self-driving simulator, which is called Carla. Um, as you can see here, if we train a perception model, uh, which is, uh, I believe is a segmentation model on Carla, uh, versus if we train that model on real data, we can see there is a big domain gap. But if we train that model on our simulated data, uh, sorry, if we train that model on our simulated data, uh, there's only 1% of from the real data, suggesting that there is a really small gap between our, mod our LiDAR simulation with the real data. And um, more impressively, may I ask a quick question here? Yeah, sure. So uh, you say basically there there is a domain 
you use the overall IOU as a measure of domain gap, but isn't like the relevant also the IOU of your training data? So uh, shouldn't like basically, shouldn't be if, if you train on real and test on real, uh, like the IOU for training and testing kind of be shown so you can see like how it differs uh, and to see whether there is a train test gap. Or how did the IOU look like in, in training, I guess? Oh, I see. Um, so typically the training IOU will be um, even higher because you're training on the data. So you, you're sort of overfitting and you, you basically perform better. And Have you're definitely- a... Before overfitting at some point, like, uh, you know, like at the point where test and validation goes apart. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it will still be a little bit higher. I, I'm, I'm just curious what the difference is, I guess, between the overfitted yeah. and the not. Because for the overfitted, did you go up to 100? Like, did you really let it fully overfit? Or when did you stop? I guess that's the interesting question. Yeah. So we basically take um, some of the sort of uh, uh, open source or cat, uh, benchmarking models from the community um borrow borrow from the two division community and and train on the semantic kitty which is also quite popular in many vision uh, tasks yeah. uh so the train wall test um i guess the fine tuning for the train wall test or fitting issue is already handled by uh, some other paper uh we just borrow their uh, hyperparameter basically uh, you use just the same training protocol, whatever it is. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So it's well established. We don't do anything yeah, yeah, special. Yeah. Makes to that. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. No problem. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, to continue, uh, we we've shown the uh, domain gap for training on different data and testing on the real data is super small between our method and the real data. Uh, and sorry, more may I ask a question? Sure. Um, so so the uh, our data, is it generate? So, so like what is the source LIDAR, LIDAR data, sensor data for generating this hours training set? Because I think like if the hours data is generated from like some uh, sensor data also from the semantic kitty, then maybe like the training data already has a smaller domain gap between uh, for, uh, between the test set and training set and compared to the Carla data, because I suppose the training data from Carla is very different from uh, semantic kitty. I'm basically talking about the, uh -huh. I don't know, like the layout of the thing, like the, job, the, the objects, the, the categories. The, uh, I'm not sure if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, I think we try our best to to make the comparison more fair in the sense, for example, uh, the original Carla and the semantic kitty, they have different LiDAR configuration, like different beams, different heights, et cetera. We try to match all of these uh, as much as we could, uh, but there are definitely some uh, limitations where we cannot uh, push, for example, um, for Carla, we have to use the Carla scenario configuration where it might have slightly different uh, actor distribution compared to the real data. Uh, that's something uh, we acknowledge, uh, but that's, um, I would say, uh, something we can improve by introducing some behavior simulation work in the future. Uh, but we didn't, you know, have enough bandwidth to address that in the current work. Yeah, I see. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talk about the testing gap, and then uh, I just want to mention one other thing, which is the training gap. So more impressively, because of our domain gap is really small, our simulated data can actually be used to augment real data and enhance learning. Uh, for example, if we just train on 100,000 examples from the real data, the detection performance is around 78%. Uh, however, after augmenting with SIM data, 
we can get even better performance with only 10% of real data. And if we use the full set of the 100K real data, as well as the simulated data, we can boost the performance even more. So to give you a little bit flavor of how the simulated LiDAR looks like, uh, we show the qualitative results of simulated and real LiDAR side by side, as well as running the same detection model um, on, on both of these data sets. Uh, as you can see, there is almost no difference. And lastly, uh, the most exciting thing about this work is to enable us testing our dry, whole driving system in a closer fashion. Uh, for any safety critical scenario, for example, like this one, where we have, um, if you can see my cursor, uh, where we have a big bus uh, occluded over Eagle Cars view. And then in the occluded area, there is a small vehicle that's gonna jump to the road. Uh, so this is definitely a very difficult scenario because your perception system is go gonna be occluded and you have very little reaction time for uh, for your driving. So suppose sure. we wanna test could I ask Sorry, a quick somewhere. question about this? Sure. Uh, um, have you thought about like like temporal consistency between these uh, ray drops? Uh, so because yeah, if you were uh -huh. to drop a ray and you come slightly forward, maybe it's more likely the uh, rays, uh, the subsequent rays would drop too, uh, uh -huh. and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think we explicitly um, talk about this or discuss this in, in this work. But my intuition is that for normal speed uh, self-driving vehicle, it may not be a super big issue because your LiDAR is um, like, most of the LiDAR is like uh, taking a sweep and then each sweep is 100 millisecond. And so whenever your LiDAR sweep is sweeping back to the same position, your ego car is already moved uh, away from its previous position by several meters away. So um, even though yeah. you're shooting the ray from the same angle, you're yeah. essentially uh, heating a very different surfaces with very different paths. So the temporal yeah. consistency may not be a super big um, issue. I see, makes sense. Uh -huh. Cool. cool. Um, so. Okay, so back to, to our uh, conversation. So for this uh, safety critical scenario, uh, we wanna test whether our driving system is safe or not. Now we can just simulate those sensor data and then feed it into our intelligent driving system and loop the decision back to the virtual environment. And now if we run everything together, we can end-to-end -end testing our driving system in an efficient, realistic and scalable manner. Okay, so I think that's pretty much everything I'd like to share today. Uh, in the last uh, one or two minutes, I'd like to conclude my talk with some future directions that I think are interesting to explore. So the first one is to learn generic visual representations beyond human adaptation. So I've been building neural representation for the work and use a combination of data and knowledge to make them generalizing better. Um, but all of these still requires human annotations, which are very expensive and limited. So moving beyond that, I believe it will be exciting to learn visual representations from unlabeled data, which provides uh, almost unlimited amount of resources. Uh, this can be achieved by, for example, uh, self-supervised or semi-supervised learning. Um, one of our recent work actually uh, work on this direction and can learn powerful features from optical flow information without any labels. Uh, those, those features can be later exploited by any perception-based robots. And the second direction is to continually exploring the simulation front and build scalable and e effective benchmark for the whole community. Uh, I believe it is very critical for having such a benchmark so that we can measure our improvement uh, very meaningfully. This also unblocked the third direction, which is to emerge embodied intelligence from interacting with a simulator 
or even interacting with the real world. In our recent work, uh, we've shown encouraging results on designing efficient closed loop training algorithm that actively interact with the simulator. And from there, we can explore many sorry, we can explore many possibilities in other robotics applications such as perception-based navigation or human-robot interaction. Um, I think that's the last slide of my talk today. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, Wenyuan. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, so now is the QA sections. Uh, anyone who have questions, uh, please just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, so I think I can begin with uh, one question. So you mentioned that um, the design of the autonomous driving instance uh, like you did can also incorporate some handcrafted or human priors to the instance. Uh, can you talk more about, but I didn't think you mentioned that during the talk in these three projects, right? Can you uh, comment more on how we can uh, incorporate some priors to the, uh, I don't know, like, uh, these uh, 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 models you just presented? Because I think, uh, because self-driving is a very safety critical scenario, right? So we sometimes we really need some um, uh, hard-coded um, policies or something to ensure such safety. And I'm just curious about how we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, for the question. Um, so maybe I can give an example by um, each of this work. So in the first work, we added, um, like, you can add whatever um, rules, hard coded rules or human prior knowledge through the learning process. Uh, basically, during learning, we've encouraged human trajectory to have low cost on our potential field, while any arbitrary uh, random trajectory to have high cost. Uh, but then, in terms of how high that cost could be, you can uh, use your imagination or your prior knowledge to, to say, okay. I know this sample trajectory is colliding with other vehicle, um, then it should be a very, very bad trajectory. So it should have a very, very high cost, meaning a high severity, right? But if it's just a, maybe um, violates some mild conditions, you can have some um, intermediate cost in between. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we can add in the learning process. And that essentially explains why our model can um, and understand traffic lights. Yes. And for maybe for another example I can give, um, let's say for the simulation one. So um, so we, uh, of course we use our, like the overall pipeline is inspired by the prior knowledge of physics model, like the recasting is inspired by the LIDAR mechanism. Um, but also when you say, uh, reconstruct these objects. There are a lot of um, human knowledge you can use, for example, the symmetry of um, the different actors. And when you reconstruct the war, um, you can use your prior knowledge that the role is going to be a planner structure. So you, you can do some um, surface reconstruction to, to smooth out those noises in your real data. So there are a lot of things you can do um, either through the learning process or post editing. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Makes sense. Thanks. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, I have a, one other quick question about the light dust in wood. Um, so as I saw, you were giving information from the simulation to predict the rate of probabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some intuition about what information maybe we can even add, like, or take away, like what's redundant or what's even more important, maybe to even improve it even further? I see, that's a, a very good question. Um, I don't have very concrete, um, like quantitative answer to that. But I think something like, for example, the incident angle uh, or the intensity of heating that surfaces, those features are very important uh, compared to other. Uh, the intuition in that, for example, 
when you do recasting, you're gonna know the intensity um, of your, the rays that hit that hit the surface and bounce back. If the intensity is really small, then you can imagine in reality, uh, if there's some other random factors affecting that rays, the intensity could be even smaller, uh, like refraction or absorbing by the atmosphere, and then eventually yeah. dropped. So you, you you wouldn't receive that. I wonder if you could integrate stuff from like other senses or like other uh, other types of sensing, like for example, mm -hmm. like how sunny or like uh, such, uh, things like that. Uh, that would. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a it, very good direction to explore. Um, I think we do have some preliminary exploration on like using, for example, fo photo um, like photorealism simulation to improve the LiDAR simulation as well as other sensor. Um, but there are definitely a lot of challenges there. For example, um, for, for sunny, for atmosphere, you don't know many Param physical parameters, and also there's yeah. an alignment issue between different sensors. So there are uh, many, many challenges we need to tackle, but I do think that's a very interesting direction to use multi-sensor uh, information. Sounds good, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, so what do you see as the role, like in, in computer vision, we have now a lot of this hype about uh, neural rendering. So what do you see as the role of neural rendering in, in the development of data-driven simulation techniques, but not only maybe for neural rendering, but also using maybe more broadly neural fields in other areas, uh, such as dynamics or maybe planning? Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Uh huh. Yeah, I do think that's a pretty promising uh, direction. Uh, of course, many people are working on that, and we see a lot of advances. Um, but I would say uh, it's more like a neural-driven uh, approach where um, you don't have some interpretability behind, so it's a little bit hard for you to do, for example, post-editing. A um, little bit hard for you to encode prior knowledge that you borrow from physics, physics law, uh, etc. So it might um, makes your learning process less efficient. Um, this is, um, I guess, a common issue for many of the neural neural field uh, paper that they use a lot of uh, images for the same source uh, scenario to train the model, and they can only overfit to a single scenario. Um, it has some difficulty to generalize. Uh, but with the current, like the LiDAR simulation paper where we borrow some physics structures, I would say it's on the other end where you can borrow more physics laws behind, but you may have some difficulty to learn some high frequency uh, representation of the world. Um, so maybe in the future, we can have a good way to combine both of these mm -hmm. uh, paradigms so that, you know, um, make more realistic simulation. Yeah. Any any other questions? So so for me, um, I also had the uh, iClear uh, submission, this uh, iClear 2023 submission, which is uh, kind of looking to the problem of neural simulator. But my my paper is many uh, many focuses on like uh, Newton's law, like some uh, rigid mm -hmm. body, soft body collisions, like dynamics. Drop, that 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 kind of uh, yeah physics, and. Although we also call ourselves as a, like a neural world model, but I think there's a big difference between uh, our work and uh, uh, the great works you, you present here. So I think for autonomous driving, I think it makes sense that we can recognize the vehicle as a, I don't know, like a rigid body and we only need to predict or uh, consider it's uh, like moving forward, turning left, turning right. and 
or do you think if there is also other dimensions of um, or other factors of its um, uh, like mm -hmm. like physics things that we need to consider for uh, in, in this in the scenario of autonomous drive? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. So I, I think for vehicles uh, we um, theoretically we can consider them as rigid body. Um, although for pedestrians or bicyclists, it might be a little bit more complicated. You know, humans can uh, have different shape and cyclists, but they can separate um, from one single object to diff two different objects. Um, but let's say, let's just focus on vehicles as uh, rigid body, but there's still issues with that um, in the sense you, your perception system is not perfect. So you don't have the ground truth estimation of its states or um, your, yeah, you're essentially trying to have an uncertainty estimation of the, those um, states. And in classical approach, you use, for example, common filter where you assume a Gaussian noises, uh, whatever, but in reality, it may be more complex than that. And that's why we need to borrow more neural network um, into the process. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is the last call. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, if there is no more questions, I think we can stop here and Let's thank Wenyuan again for this great talk.